Hello, fellow Rebel Capitals. Hope you're well. Wanted to go over some information, some secrets of the banksters. That if the general public knew these secrets, the abilities that the banksters themselves have, I think they would go out to the streets with the pitchforks and the in the torches. We would see civil unrest. They'd riot, let's say. And I think that was a, a quote or it's close to a quote that came from, was it JP Morgan or maybe it was JP or Morgan Rockefeller, or Rockefeller. Someone like that. It said if, if people really knew uh, how the banking system works, there would be riots in the streets. And I'm not just talking about fractional reserve banking. That, that is not what we're talking about here. It, it's, it's way, way, way beyond that. And before we start the video, I want to congratulate, or I want to recognize Josh for his awesomeness and having a poster of Jeff Snyder in his room. When I was Josh's age, I had a poster of Carmen Electra and Pamela Anderson. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. Jeff Snyder's pretty cool as well. <laughs> uh, it's just in a little bit different way, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's shoot over to first my Twitter feed because this really kind of uh, summarizes what people really don't understand about the banking system. This is their, by far, their biggest blind spot. And I'm not talking about just the retail investor. I'm talking about the pros as well. I just got back from the New Orleans Investment Conference and 99% of the speakers there don't even get this. So let's go to my, oh, let me do a screen share, Josh. And then let's go over to my Twitter feed. And this is um, a tweet, and I, somehow I got tied up in this uh, thread, or I, I don't really know how it works. I guess they at mentioned me or something like that. So this guy, his handle is uh, Dishonest Money, okay? He says, Zerp, QE, and Greed have created this housing bubble. And he goes on to show, uh, what is this, the average price? Um, okay. Uh, I don't think QE has created the housing bubble. I think he's got a point of ZERP. And greed, uh, I don't buy that because that would imply that somehow there's more greed today than there was in the 1960s or in the 1980s. And uh, I think that's a, I think that's a, a non-starter right there. I, I don't think that's really a, a relevant point. So anyway, here, uh, this person, Matt... H. H. replied, George Gammon argues there isn't a direct transfer between QE and the bank lending, uh, i.e. banks have never said we'd really like to offer this mortgage, but we haven't got the reserves right now. If only the B Bank of England would buy the gilts so I can lend. And so he, he's kind of stating my, my position correctly. Really, my position is that uh, QE itself doesn't, uh, I mean, technically, uh, it, it should or it could expand the balance sheet capacity of the banks to lend, although they're not lending out those bank reserves. They're creating new cash, new M2 money supply. Uh, but in, in practice, not the way it works. Because why? Because the banks themselves can create their own dollar assets, in, in this case, the United States and the euro dollar system, and their own dollar liabilities. So they don't need bank reserves to do that. They, not at all. Uh, that this is a fallacy. And this, I think what it goes back to is people instinctively think of dollars, electronic currency units, as if they are little gold coins. So the bank, let's just say, lends out these gold coins. and Or let's just say they lend out paper claims on the gold coins. So even with fractional reserve banking, if they have 10 gold coins, well, they can lend out, I don't know, let's say 90 claims on these coins. So they can lend out more claims than, uh, or they can create more claims than they have gold coins. But this would, again, imply that they can't create those gold coins. There, there's something there that constrains them, right? So in most people's worldview, 
these bank reserves are just like little gold, gold coins where the uh, central bank does quantitative easing and therefore gives the banks more of these little gold coins. And if they have more of the little gold coins, then they can lend out more of the little gold coins or they can lend out more paper claims on those gold coins. But if the banks or if the central bank, excuse me, would not have given them those gold coins, well, then they're stuck. They're stuck. They can't lend any more money. They uh, they ran out. And since the Fed gave them more little gold coins, well, now all of a sudden, the Fed has injected liquidity into the system. This is utter nonsense. This is, this is again, it's like a, it's almost like a cartoonish version of how money really works. And when I'm using money, I, I'm, I'm not saying the actual definition, the real definition, I'm saying just currency units, right? But this, like I said, is a huge blind spot and creates more confusion for the amateurs and the pros than anything I've ever seen by far. This is in the, the, the ranking system, this is number one through 100 as far as the biggest contributor to confusion on how global macro works. So let's, uh, the, the next um, tweet here, I guess, in this thread, is this person saying, I would refer George Gammon to the following two charts that show how QE ends up in circulation. So see, this is the, the gold coin uh, view, we'll call it. And so here's his chart, which is, listen, hats off to really well done. Bravo, obviously took a lot of time in doing this. And, and I think this is a very smart way to understand how money works. Uh, obviously, this is what I do on all my white, whiteboard videos. And this little trick of just doing the balance sheets has, has helped me improve my thinking a thousand times uh, since I started my YouTube channel. Just this little trick of when I'm trying to think through how things work, let's just set up a quick little T, assets on the left, liabilities on the right. Let's see how this works with each, with each one of these transactions. So this is really good stuff. Uh, and from, I just scanned this briefly, but from what I could tell, I mean, he's got the numbers right. So he's got, uh, you know, how things start, then with QE, then with a cash withdrawal. And uh, he shows how the liabilities of the banks start off $60. But uh, then they withdraw the $60. And uh, then they're left, then there's $60 in, uh, in, in banknotes circulating around the economy. Um, okay, so my, my response here is that uh, with, with M2 money supply, you start with 60 and end with 60. So even based on this chart, you're, you're not increasing M2. So uh, I know this sounds a little snarky, but I'm actually trying to help him out here because he's, and actually, you know, I do my very best to take the high road. Because uh, there are a lot of people out there on Twitter that, uh, you know, kind of tweet like this as though it's kind of insinuating that I don't know what I'm talking about and that they're going to teach me. They're going to somehow give me a lesson or something like that. And that this is just something that I haven't thought through. Um, if you're one of those people that want to do that on Twitter, uh, go nuts, but think long and hard about that. <laughs> and just remember, I'm someone that's done what, Josh? What, maybe 700 whiteboard videos? Yeah. <laughs> on YouTube in the last three years. And I'm completely retired. It's not that I'm smart by any stretch of the imagination. I guarantee this person's smarter than I am. But I don't do anything. I don't have a job. I, I retired. All I do all day long is think about global macro and how the banking system works. So if anyone on this live stream allocated half as much time into understanding these things as I have, they would probably even know more than I do. <laughs> but my whole point here is before you try to do like a gotcha tweet, um, make, make, sure you're, make sure you know your stuff because uh, uh, I, I think I might have a little bit of an edge here. But anyway, 
So what I did is I said, let me help you with that. Because what he's trying to prove is there's more purchasing power. Therefore, uh, you know, there's more currency units chasing goods and services. And this would be inflationary QE, this, this argument that you hear all the time that QE is inflationary, QE in and of itself. And so I said, do the balance sheets again, but this time the Fed buys bonds from a non-bank entity. See, if he would have, see here in his example, the Fed is buying bonds from a bank. But if the Fed would have bought bonds from a non-bank entity, what would have happened to the commercial bank liabilities? Yeah, he, he in would other have been, words, M2 yeah. money supply. That, he would have been correct under that circumstance. That's right. Or if, or if they bought them from the treasury and then the treasury spent it. Directly. That's more of a prolonged, uh, not direct way to inject. Yeah, liquidity. but there again, you, you've got to add in the primary dealers. Yeah. So the Fed's buying direct in, in reality and in, in practice, if we really, really want to get uh, accurate, you've got to have the, uh, the central bank, you've got to have the primary dealer, uh, you've got to have the banks, and then you've got to have the non-bank entities in the real economy. And you've got to start off by asking, okay, where are the non-bank entities buying these uh, treasuries? If they're, or where are the primary dealers, excuse me? If they're buying them from the non-banks, then correct. Uh, this would increase M2 money supply. Now, let's go ahead and take it to a further extreme, or let's back up one step further and say, okay, well, let's say that these banks um, actually purchased the T-bills or the T-bonds or whatever from the treasury directly, and let's just say they did that five years ago. So, Josh, if a bank buys a treasury directly from the treasury and then the treasury spends the money without the central bank involved, does that increase M2 money supply? Once the treasury then goes out and spends it through deficit Correct. spending. Correct. So then uh, then this, then this he starts kind of where we just left off with the central bank buying from the commercial bank and therefore not increasing M2. But it would have increased M2 back when the bank, commercial bank, bought from the treasury in the first place. You see, now if a non-bank entity buys from the treasury, then when the Fed buys it from them via the primary dealer, then it will increase M2. And I know that gets a little confusing. And again, guys, let me be very clear. I understand this stuff extremely well, not because I'm smart. Uh, I would argue I'm, I'm no smarter than the average Joe and Jane. I, mean, I guarantee you, if I did like an IQ test, it would be average at best, at best. But it's just I've taken the time to really, really noodle over this uh, over and over and over again. And when you start to try to explain this stuff uh, on a YouTube video in front of you know, millions of people, um, it kind of refines your thinking. And uh, you go ahead and make those mistakes publicly, like I have sometimes. And uh, then you just keep refining, refining, and refining and talking to the people that do know a lot more than you do, like that guy on your wall, Jeff Snyder. And then you start to see things much clearer and it becomes almost like a sixth sense for like the global monetary system, right? And then the second chart he shows is of currency and circulation, which just basically, I'm assuming there's green pieces of paper and okay, the green pieces of paper went up. But uh, how are green pieces of paper any different from electronic digits as far as dollars, as liabilities on the bank balance sheet or in your checking deposit, as far as purchasing power, they're the exact same. And as far as inflation, deflation, disinflation goes, it, it would be the exact same. It doesn't matter if that currency unit is in your back pocket or on your, uh, on your checking account uh, and you can access it via your debit card, it, it's still purchasing power. Okay, so now let's go over and check out this, the, the whole misconception and what leads people to, uh, I'm not going to say make the mistakes that we saw on Twitter, because I, I don't know that those were full on mistakes. Um, I, I think that they're definitely going in the right direction. Uh, and I think they were, were very, very good, but they might not have seen thing. They might not have seen the multiple dimensions or layers that are involved in not just QE, but let's just talk, let's just say money, using that term very loosely, using that term synonymously with dollars, the banking system, and the, the global monetary system. And this 
is I outlined it on last night's whiteboard video. So if you guys haven't watched that, I'd strongly suggest doing so. But this is a little snippet here. And this describes as, as succinctly as I possibly can the blind spot that people have. And that that and this shows you how uh, people think about money or dollars in terms of these little gold coins that the banks can't produce. And then it, it, it makes you realize that that is an utter fallacy. There are no gold coins that the banks can't produce. There, in fact, there is nothing, there is zero that the banks can't produce themselves, including collateral, including collateral. So, you know, when people talk about, uh, when Snyder, and I've had this conversation with him, when he talks about a collateral uh, scarcity, it, it isn't necessarily a shortage of collateral. It's a, sh it's a shortage of confidence in the system itself. Because if there was enough confidence in the system, then they would rehypothecate the existing collateral, which increases the risk, but there would be more risk tolerance. Therefore, there's pretty much unlimited amounts of collateral. When you think about the ability for these primary dealers to rehypothecate the T-bills or the mortgage-backed securities or whatever they're using for collateral. So I would argue that there that there's no there's no there's definitely no constraint on the amount of dollars that the banks can create and there and I would argue there isn't a constraint even on the collateral that they can they can create. The only constraint or the only thing that is scarce is the confidence the counterparty will pay you back. That's what's scarce. And that's what people have to get their mind around. That there, there is nothing in the global monetary system that the banks can't create themselves. Therefore, it doesn't matter what the Fed's doing. It, it's just, it's just nonsense. It's, 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 it's monetary theater, if you will. The thing that really matters when you get to the core of the issue is perceived counterparty risk. So let's go through this, Josh, and hopefully it'll help people understand it to a greater degree. Let me go ahead and turn up the volume. They don't need bank reserves from the Fed denominated in dollars to create dollar denominated loans. And if you go back to step number one and you see how these dollars just went right onto the balance sheet of the Swiss National Bank, you have to realize there's no reason the commercial banks can't do the same Thing. Right. So there's one point right there that most people don't think through. How is it that the Fed can create all of these dollars? How No one would argue that, oh, the, the Fed can't create any more loans or the Fed can't buy any more uh, treasuries. Nobody has ever argued that. Why? They've never argued that because we know that the Fed can create an unlimited amount of bank reserves denominated in dollars to buy the treasuries. So if the Fed can do it, why can't the commercial banks? Josh, help me remember here. What, what is the Federal Reserve? Just a, a bank. Or There you go. There, it's a bank. It's a bank. The Federal Reserve is a bank. The Bank of England is a bank. The Swiss National Bank is a bank. <laughs> as crazy as that sounds. And yeah, so that kind of that kind of leads you to the next logical conclusion. Well, how can a bank go bust if the only way, if the only constraint on the system is counterparty risk? And that I think you say it best, George, it's only a bank can only go bust if other banks don't want don't want to do business with you anymore. Yeah. And what that boils down to is because the banks have to transfer liabilities. So when, let's think, that's a great point, Josh. So let's, let's tug on that thread a bit. So the, the banks have to transfer their liability. So if you're, let's say, Josh, you're banking with Wells Fargo and I'm banking with uh, the Bank of America and you owe me a thousand bucks. So you just go to Zelle or whatever and you Zelle me the thousand dollars. So Wells Fargo, they're, checking deposits or their liabilities would go down by $1,000 because they're transferring that $1,000 liability to Bank of America. 
because Bank of America is putting it into my account. Therefore, the liability of the uh, side of their balance sheet increases by a thousand. Okay, well, they can't just transfer them a thousand dollar liability. They have to also transfer them a thousand dollar asset, or they have to decrease their assets by a thousand dollars. So let's just say that Wells Fargo had an account with B of A. Well, they could simply say, all right, B of A, add this thousand dollar liability to George's account, but decrease a thousand dollars in liabilities from our account. Therefore, your assets match up with the liabilities. Or what they can do is transfer the liability and they can transfer an asset such as uh, a bank reserve, right? And uh, then that would make sure that the assets and liabilities match up. But you see, the Fed is the only bank that doesn't have to transfer a liability because all the liabilities or all the assets of the commercial banking system is on the Fed's balance sheet. So let's just say that uh, Wells Fargo has to transfer bank, let's say it's a transaction between the two banks and they have to transfer a billion dollars from Wells Fargo to B of A. Does the Fed have to transfer assets to do that? No, they just simply move the liabilities around on their balance sheet. Nothing changes as far as the total size of their balance sheet. You see, so this is why if you really want to get technical, the only way the banks can go out of business. Because at the end of the day, they have to transfer those liabilities. Therefore, they have to have assets. Or the Fed doesn't have to transfer any liabilities. Therefore, they really don't need any assets other than just for window dressing to say that they have positive equity. See, th this is what we're dealing with here, guys. And I this is something that 99.9% that .9 of people out there, even the pros, they don't get. Yeah, I think you have to take that to the next step too, because what about the euro dollar system or prior to 2008 that there was no reserves pretty much. So you wouldn't even really transfer an asset, would you? Wouldn't you? It's only counterparty risk. No, you're transferring an asset. And this is a great point. You're transferring an asset, but they're creating the assets. So let, let's, let's go through this here real quick, Josh, and it'll make a lot more sense. But just write that down. That's a great point. And let's revisit that as soon as we get done with this little clip. Well, there is one reason, and that's counterparty risk. And that's the point, pretty much, of this whole video. Well, let's go over to some sample balance sheets so you guys can get your head around this. We've got bank A, bank B, assets on the left, liabilities on the right. So basically, let's assume, just like our first example here in step one with the central bank, that bank A has, let's just say, a checking account. Bank B, Bank B, that's a checking account of Bank A. And these checking accounts are liabilities of the specific bank. So to be crystal clear, this checking account that Bank B has, it's an asset on its balance sheet. This checking account is with Bank A, therefore it's a liability. So however much or however many dollars Bank B has in their checking account with Bank A, that many dollars would be a liability of bank A and vice versa. So bank A goes to bank B and says, hey, listen, we both need dollars. So I'll just go ahead and credit your account with a billion dollars. And you can go ahead and credit my account with a billion dollars. So that would be an additional liability of a billion dollars for both of these banks. But remember, they are increasing their own checking account by a billion as well. So you have an additional billion dollars in your checking account, which would be an asset to offset the $1 billion liability that you just added to your balance sheet by adding the dollars to the other bank's checking account to begin with. So Josh, in that process, how much QE was involved? <laughs> yeah, nothing. Uh, I, I think what most people... How many green pieces of paper? Yeah, it's strictly just digits on a screen. But I, it's I think... Just, it's just ledgers. It, you, you, what you're talking about, at the end of the day, if you really, really want to get technical, outside of green pieces of paper, dollars are nothing but commercial bank ledgers. That, that's, that's all we're talking about here. 
It's just a commercial bank ledger. It's just an entry in a commercial bank ledger. So why should we be foolish enough to think that the banks are somehow constrained by the what they enter into their own little electronic ledger? I mean, it, it's utter nonsense. It's, it's just nonsense. It's like me having my own QuickBooks account and, and somehow people are uh, under the impression that I'm constrained by the number of accounts I can put in my chart of accounts. No, it's limitless. I can put as many chart of accounts as I want. And the bank, it's the exact same thing. But let's, let's think this through. So where these banks would get into trouble is if Bank B now all of a sudden had to, let's say they uh, create a loan for a billion dollars, right? Well, what's going to happen if they have to transfer that liability because the customer is with Bank C? Okay, well, the only way that would work, because see, the only assets they have are with Bank A. So what they could do is they could say, hey, Bank A, go ahead and give Bank C my billion dollars in uh in in dollar excuse my my billion dollars that are liabilities on your balance sheet and they could go ahead and do that right or what they could do is bank c had an account with bank a then they could say hey bank a go ahead and draw down my account by a billion bank b saying this and then go ahead and give it to bank c and then it's a wash so you see what's required here and is this gets more and more technical and complex are these banks have to have corresponding banking relations or correspondent banking relationships, you see. But if they all have these accounts with each other, and as long as there's plenty of confidence that all these banks have a fortress balance sheet, then there's nothing stopping them from doing all of this. And again, creating as many dollar liabilities or dollar assets as they want. So this goes back to you know, the swap lines, the point of the video, and, and a lot of people say, oh, George, who cares? $11 billion in a swap line? That's chump change. No, no, no. What you're not getting is this is an indication that this system that I'm talking about right here is breaking down. Because if this system is operating on all eight cylinders, the banks can create any type of as many dollars as they want. They don't need to go to the Swiss National Bank. So the fact, it doesn't matter if it's 5 billion, 3 billion, 11 billion, where there's smoke, there's fire. And, and that's what I'm talking about here. And it, I try to even simplify it further, Josh. So let's keep going here. Well, I know that gets a little confusing, but basically the easiest way to think about it. Can you turn it up a little? Banks, they've got checking accounts with one another. One bank deposits money or dollars in the other bank's checking account. And the other bank does the same thing for the first bank. And voila, you have created dollars in a cashless, bank reserveless system without. There you go. So what was the point you were making before that I said to write down? Um, that the, the prior to 2008, the banks can just create all the assets and liabilities that they want. There you go. Just like so, that. This is why that we could have a $40 trillion uh, global monetary system. Or, or it's probably bigger than that. But as far as the amount of dollars circulating in the global monetary system could be, you know, 40, 50 trillion dollars with only 40 billion dollars of bank reserves on the Fed's balance sheet. Yeah, I think the next step of pushback you would get there is, OK, maybe that's in the euro dollar system. But but back home, we have Basel three. And, and this is kind of what my framework was until we talked to Snyder. And it's well. Basel three doesn't really mean anything because you can create all the, the assets and liabilities. Your bank gets bigger and bigger then your Basel three restrictions kick in and you're screwed. You can't make any more loans. Well, what did Snyder say? All, all you really have to do is let's say you're JP Morgan and you have a subsidiary bank in London. You would just take out a loan from that London bank, reducing your assets and liabilities to where you have no more constraints. Or at least reduce your deposit liabilities. So if the regulation is regarding the deposit liabilities, an example, well, fine. Just offload a deposit liability and just bring on a, a loan liability. Done, right? Or maybe it's something on the asset side of your balance sheet with uh, tier one capital or something like that. Okay, fine. 
So you got mortgage-backed securities on there. Just get credit default swaps for them. You get credit default. In fact, Bank A can issue credit default swaps to Bank B. And bank B can issue credit default swaps to Bank A, right? So meaning insurance. So they can insure each other's balance sheets. And if those balance sheets are insured, then all of a sudden, all of those risky, toxic assets become, quote unquote, tier one capital or, you know, whatever the term is. I, I may be using that term incorrectly, but the, the concept is the same. You get it, right? Where and, and the concept is these banks are so far ahead of the regulators. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's laughable to think that the regulators are somehow ahead of the banksters in the euro dollar system. I mean, that, that's preposterous. So uh, these banks, I think it's safe to assume that they're way ahead. So to think that they can't manage their balance sheet around these regulations to continue to expand, even if it's off balance sheet, or even if it's shenanigans between the banks themselves. I mean, I, I think it's utterly ridiculous to assume that... Um, you know, that there's anything constraining their balance sheets, including regulations. So that's more speculative because I have no proof of that. I can't just put that up on a whiteboard and go back and forth with the balance sheets and see how they interact. So that requires some, uh, I, I think that would say, I, I, I think I could say that's a hypothesis. I'd be pretty confident that it was accurate, but still a hypothesis. This, what I'm talking about with the bank's balance, this is not a hypothesis. This is just simple, straightforward. This is how it works. Uh, and anyone can do this if they just have a piece of paper, a pen, and just put out the T's like this and just make and just make sure the assets have to match up with the liabilities. And you can see how many ways that you can get creative in creating dollars yourself on your little notepad. And trust me, if you can figure out creative ways to create dollars out of nothing, the banksters definitely, definitely can as well. <laughs> All right, guys, thanks for hanging out with us. I think that's really most people's blind spot. So I know it gets a little esoteric and kind of uh, nerdy, but I think it's really important that we understand how that works. So uh, as always, enjoy the rest of your afternoon and make sure that you're standing up for freedom, liberty, free market capitalism, and economic education. I'll see you on the next video.